This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Today, Liz Wolf and I are talking with Kurt Mills, a foreign policy reporter and executive editor of the American Conservative which speaks for the kinds of conservatives who don't believe America's military should be in the business of nation building or spreading democracy or really any of the other tasks beyond providing collective self-defense for this country. We wanted to bring him on to discuss President Biden's open-ended military engagement with the Houthis in Yemen, as well as a the uh, $95 billion foreign aid package that just passed the Senate that will be spread between Ukraine, Israel, Gaza, and the Indo-Pacific. Also to reflect a bit on some of Putin's recent comments in an interview with Tucker Carlson and what they might reveal about the Russia-Ukraine war. Kurt, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, You've written that uh, on the topic of Ukraine, Russia, you've written that uh, in an article titled How the Ukraine Delusion May End, that Putin may sue for a that you believe Putin uh, is likely to sue for a temporary shock piece in the middle of 2024. Um, I'm curious uh, what you think about his recent comments to uh, on that topic in his interview with Tucker Carlson, which uh, Carlson published last week. Let's roll that clip to kick us off, and then I'd love to get your thoughts. Do the United States need this? What for? Thousands of miles away from your national territory. Don't you have anything better to do? You have issues on the border, issues with migration, issues with the national debt, more than $33 trillion. You have nothing better to do, so you should fight in Ukraine? Wouldn't it be better to negotiate with Russia, make an agreement, already understanding the situation that is developing today? So what do you make of what Putin is saying there? Um... Well, it's obviously he's been briefed on a lot of the sort of lines of argument that will be palatable to an American audience, because I think the uh, number of people that hold such a perspective is reaching crescendo as we get into the presidential election year. Um, I think the things that are anchoring 24 are first, there's a Russian presidential election in March of 2024. And so while sort of cartoonish take on Russian politics is that it, it's a fait accompli, and it is a fait accompli. Putin's going to win. Um, the reality is it's, it's a massive country, 11 time zones famously, and dictatorship itself um, is complex, and there are nuances on what exactly the terms of Putin's uh, victory will be and what exactly that will do to serve as a launch pad for his approach going forward in 24. Additionally, there's the huge X factor of whether or not Trump will win. And then also the Russian appraisal of whether or not Trump will be a more reliable partner than Biden. Uh, I think that the case, I, I, I don't know if I'm quite ready to go likely, but I think the case is certainly super underrated in the sense of it's, it's, it's a reasonable bet uh, that the Russian calculus for a deal uh, this year, some sort of ceasefire or even a more formal armistice um, could be on the table. And I think the rationale makes makes sense for both the Putin and the, the Biden administration side. For the Putin side, uh, you know, obviously the 2022 campaign uh, did not go well. So this war, uh, although the momentum is in the Russian position, um, has still been a mess. Um, it gives the Russians the chance to consolidate its gains. It's not going to get, you know, recognition. It's not going to get a treaty. Um, And it gives Biden a chance to uh, remove a major political issue from the conversation heading into the general election. Now, I think polling is pretty evenly divided on the subject. I think if you you look at it, uh, probably a net number of Americans still have a favorable disposition towards uh, financing the war effort 
on Ukraine, but that number is radically down from where it was 24 months ago. And additionally, quite similar to maybe where the Democratic base was, the capital D Democratic base was in 2004 with the Rock, um, it's a, becoming a highly motivating issue for Republicans to turn out. So, you know, 55 percent of Americans supporting Ukraine and 40 percent wanting to negotiate. Those numbers aren't necessarily equal um, if it drives Republican turnout. How do you think Putin is looking at the pretty stunning congressional dysfunction we've had on this? I mean, just today and yesterday in the news, um, you know, we saw, I guess, last night today, we're recording this on Tuesday, February 13th, um, you know, yesterday, um, in the Senate, 17 Republicans uh, broke with their party uh, in order to get a um, an aid package devoted to Ukraine and to Israel uh, over a procedural hurdle. But then today, news broke early this morning that another five Republicans had also broke with their party. Uh, so now we have 22 Republicans joining with Democrats in the Senate, getting it through. Now there's the question of what will be happening in the House. But I imagine Putin is watching the sort of fracturing of the GOP specifically on this issue of Ukraine aid? How do you think that factors into his equation? Oh, I mean, I think it factors in rather rather large because I think the even if the numbers are relatively evenly divided on the Republican elected official side uh, right now, clearly uh, the sort of celebrity spirit of the party is with uh, realism and restraint and kind of making some sort of deal with the Russians. So uh, the Senate leadership and part of the House leadership uh, is in favor of some sort of Ukraine aid package. But a lot of times it's, you know, these Senate chairmen were uh, House chairmen that nobody's ever heard of. Meanwhile, the sort of VIPs, Trump, Carlson, Bannon, Matt Gates, even the Speaker of the House, they're all clearly on another side. Um, and I, I, just, I just don't see how the momentum uh, uh, reverses. I mean, even if they were able to get something like this again, uh, I, this is going to be like the last package. And then to, to an extent that undermines the rationale for this package, like how many more packages will, will this take? That there is this there is this sort of creeping logic um, that is redolent of, of past conflicts, both your war on terror, which is, you know, we can't cut and run because we've already, you know, put so much investment in into the theater, which is, you know, I'm not an econ person per se, but that seems like a pretty clear sunk cost fallacy. And then secondly, uh, you know, this is the kind of rationale uh, that kept World War I going for years and years and years. More must die because so many have died. But isn't this different than war on terror related logic, right? I mean, if the U.S. fails to support Ukraine uh, in this way, if, you know, this spending bill falls through and falls through in the House or gets tied up specifically with all of these border stipulations that Republicans are trying to get through, Ukraine no longer has much of a fighting chance, right? Like, how does how does that play out? It's a, it's a different situation in a sense. Well, we don't actually know. I mean, like, if the European rhetoric really is at all rooted in reality, you would think that some of these European powers could up their military spending beyond three percent of GDP. Yeah. And so, if, if the U.S. actually does pull out, um, I. I yeah, I, the most the most likely candidate is Britain, which has been the most hawkish country in the West on this subject. Um, but the Schultz government in Germany has also been quite hawkish and Poland has been quite hawkish. I mean, you could see some kind of piecemeal package come in to keep this war going. Um, but the reality is that the U.S. has been the major benefactor from start to finish on this so far. Uh, you know, Liz mentioned the way that this has been tied to domestic issues like border security. Senator Rand Paul uh, w spearheaded a, a filibuster against this bill in the Senate, um, and I've pulled just a minute or so of that, you know, I think 20-something hour filibuster um, that I want to play. So let's uh, roll that, and I'd like to ask you about the connection between foreign aid and border security and whether there is one, but let's hear from Rand Paul. What we have here is a Ukraine first bill. This bill was never really about securing our border, but about securing another's country's border. What we have here is a failure of the elites of Washington on both sides of the aisle, the leadership in the Democrat party, the leadership in the Republican party. What we have here is a failure 
of these elites to understand that the American people want to put America first. 61% of Americans live from paycheck to paycheck, and they want to put Ukraine first. I want you to talk to your constituents at home, the ones who live paycheck to paycheck, and tell them why you're shipping $60 billion to Ukraine. So uh, what could you just talk uh, reflect a little bit on you know this shift that has happened within the GOP um and you know what is it uh you know there there's some some different foreign policy factions right now both in the republican on the republican side and on the democratic side mm -hmm. what are the major frac factions and who do you think is winning the argument right now um, on both sides. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so uh, I think it's my, my, my sort of guidepost to this always is that the, the greatest uh, risk of a Republican administration is a war with Iran and the greatest risk of a Democratic administration is a war with Russia. And I think if you look at how the Trump and uh, Biden administrations have, have played out, uh, we obviously got way closer to a war with Russia and got way closer to a war with Iran during the past, you know, Democratic and Republican administrations, respectively. Um, so uh, Russia exists, especially in the Democratic establishment mind space, um, as this kind of great boogeyman, right? Um, and I don't think this is expressed so much in the elected official level, but you don't have to go very far. MSNBC, a lot of the center left press, you know, sort of sees Putin as the head of the, the global alt right, for lack of a better term right he's a gangster white christian murderer heterosexual whatever like and so uh you know and versus iran is the same thing it's 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 the big you know it's the big muslim power and i so i think you, you see a lot of motivation on the center left democratic side for this war i think you see some dissent i mean i think on the vote last night uh, uh senator sanders and senator uh, Merkley from Oregon, uh, you know, the sort of traditional super kind of like progressive, um, you know, Eugene McCarthy kind of wing, uh, it uh, opposed some of this. But, you know, even Sanders' office has been has been pretty hawkish on Russia, I think, really since the 2016 bit. I mean, I mean Sanders was a complete Russiagate believer, unfortunately, in my view. Um, and so I, mean, I think you see a, a rather unicameral response or a united response for the Democrats. There, there, there's, there's behind the scenes realities of the fissures. Before the 2022 election, uh, the the House Progressive Caucus considered um, some sort of, you know, more moderate language uh, resolution on Ukraine. Um, but Jaya Paul, the congresswoman from Washington State, I believe, uh, nixed it or was, was cajoled into nixing it. Um, so I think, you know, I think you see pretty much democratic unity on the war. There, of course, is, you know, not at the elected level. There is this sort of Glenn Greenwald, Noam Chomsky sort of left libertarian uh, thing. But they, I don't think they're super represented um, in the elected level, um, especially with a democratic president. Um, on the Republican side, I think you see a residual um, hawkish conservative establishment, which is weak. So uh, contra the Democratic establishment, which still controls uh, the Democratic Party. So that's why Biden and Clinton have been the nominees of the party the last 10 years. Uh, the Republican establishment is, is weaker. So that's why Trump has been the nominee uh, of the party the last 10 years. And the Republican establishment view, of course, these people like Mitch McConnell, Mitt Romney, represented like voices by like the Wall Street Journal editorial board, National Review. Um, it's very what I would call they would probably call it themselves, you know, neo Reaganite, right? Which is like Reagan wouldn't abandon the Ukrainians, even though it's like, I think, a tendentious counterfactual line of argument. Um, they make it. Um, and they still have sort of uh, default support in uh, elected races that aren't um, 
super high profile, right? Like, you know, if like the Congressional Committee of the Republicans uh, or the Senatorial Committee of the Republicans uh, wants to back somebody in a state and spend a lot of money. I mean, for instance, the the, the Montana race is, is actually a, a, the Senate race this year between Mr. Sheehy and Mr. Rosendale is actually pretty emblematic. It's something that nobody's paying attention to. There's not even a million people in Montana, uh, I believe. Um, and, uh, you know, like, she, he is the sort of like classic military vet, you know, will be pretty hawkish, I think, at least at least uh, in his default rhetoric, unless he's sort of pushed in a direction versus someone like Rosendale, who has more bespoke politics, um, you know, uh, and, and even Trump, you know, himself can ha has sort of savvily skirt some of these wings. But it's clear that Trump's own biases are clearly with the anti-establishment, his own views. And then on the other side, I think you see a lot of uh, rising stars in the party on the Republican side, um, really uh, just sort of jumping the line and, and, and you know, fighting each other to, to be the vanguard of this stuff. So um, I think on the Senate side, or even the congressional side, the most important elected official on this stuff is now J.D. Vance. Um, I think the most longstanding um, uh, articulator of this perspective has been Rand Paul, um, although obviously Rand Paul, there's some differences between his sort of libertarian wing of conservatism and the sort of nationalist wing that came with Trump's election. Um, Matt Gates has mentioned uh, Josh Hawley has had a certain perspective. I think it's a little bit different than these guys. And then there's also people, of course, who who argue that they are furthering the Trump mission uh, by supporting Ukraine. Um, which I think is not so much uh, an argument you can make, but they're making it. This is people like uh, Pompeo, um, uh, Mike Pompeo, the former Secretary of State, and probably more quietly, someone like Tom Cotton. Uh, but again, I just think the tide has, has super turned. I mean, if the Ukrainians had, had done as well um, as they had done in 2022 over a series of months of 23 and 24, perhaps we were having a different discussion. Um, but the reality is that, the, is that the war is not going well with unprecedented support from, from the West. Um, and then I think a lot of a lot of ways we've just sort of bounced back to where we were in the late 2010s, where the Republican Party is just really skeptical of this stuff. Is there a difference between, um, you know, you mentioned, you know, Rand, Rand Paul's long been this libertarian non-interventionist in the Senate. And then you've got the rising sort of nationalist America first ism. Uh, of J.D. Vance, um, who is opposed to Ukraine, but it's not clear to me how that translates to any other for like I can kind of predict where Rand Paul is going to fall on any given foreign intervention. Uh, J.D. Vance, not so much. Would you be able to clarify that for me a little bit? Are they more uh, they're allied on this issue, but would we expect that coalition to hold for other major foreign policy? Issues. What's an example where you think it could fall apart? Well, I mean, uh, you mentioned Iran is a big, uh, you know, that that's kind of like the boogeyman of the Republican Party. Uh, Trump obviously assassinated one of their top generals. Um, is that something where, you know, you would see a Rand Paul and uh, a J.D. Vance coming together, let's say, Things in the Middle East start, it, you know, this starts turning into a bigger and bigger regional war. Would you see it likely that they would um, be on the same side in that type of scenario? I think you're basically intuiting a dispositional uh, difference between uh, Paul and Vance on the Middle East. I think it's a reasonable intuition. Um, however, I think on the uh, functional major issues and votes that we have records on, um, Paul also opposed the Iran deal. No Republican in Congress supported yeah. the Iran deal. So there's no distinction between Vance's public statements and, and Paul's uh, votes on that. And then um, it's hard to imagine that Vance wouldn't have been uh, in the contingent of people that were around Tucker Carlson um, during the Soleimani strike that you mentioned. Um, yeah. you know, the, the kind of people lobbying Trump not to escalate further. So while there may be some philosophical framework um, distinctions between the two um, as, as expressed in any meaningful way, I, I think they would pretty much be on the same side. It, 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 it's, it's, it's hard. Uh, who knows what happens going to happen in the future, but it, it's, it's hard to imagine uh, Vance at the vanguard of supporting war with Iran. No, 
Yeah, go ahead, Liz. Well, I was I was curious, Kurt, whether I mean you are now in charge of the American Conservative, which um, you know has a very long history of sort of um, you know supporting and taking seriously the non-interventionist cause. But I'm curious because it feels like we've seen this huge um, this sea change, this huge shift over the last few years, in particular, where we have these. Um, pretty provocative, pretty inflammatory sort of contingent of frequently newly elected Republicans, um, where the rhetoric is almost populist on a whole bunch of domestic policy issues and then pretty staunchly non-interventionist. To me, it, it feels like there's almost this like ascendant wing and I can't quite put my finger on how it emerged. Can you trace me? Like, do you, do you agree with that characterization? And can you trace me through the sort of lineage of what we're seeing today? You mean like how do you square um, uh, a disposition that is both upset with the excesses of American empire, um, but also thinks that basically Americans are getting a raw deal at home? Yeah. And it feels particularly the thing that I'm most interested in is that it feels like this you know, there have been people with perhaps these these inklings before, but it feels like a creature of the last like five years in particular. It feels like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, this particular sort of type of politician didn't exist in, in numbers. Am I wrong there? No, no, no. I think I think that's all right. I mean, look, there, there were there were antecedents or predece yeah. predecessors to Trump, right? I mean, Buchanan, yeah. uh, the, the, the co-founder of this magazine, uh, Ross Perot, um, you know, and then I but mean, Ross Perot is a more marginal figure. And now we're talking about a substantial enough wing of the Republican Party for them to actually be able to have influence and affect what type of legislation gets passed. I mean, we have enough people who share this sort of loose collection of beliefs to be able to actually, um, you know, fracture the Republican Party in a really significant way. I'm even thinking of just like the types of things that have been in, been in the headlines over the last three years. This has become a um, really salient current political phenomenon in a way that it wasn't 10 years ago. Um, I agree with you. I think the country's mood is darkened uh, considerably. My only point with the Perot thing is though, I mean, he ran an independent candidacy and he got 20%, which is, yeah. I believe, one of the, the first or second greatest performance of an independent candidate in American history. Uh, and I mean, you can imagine if Perot had tried to contest the nomination of a party like Trump did. Like, like Trump ran third party in 2000, didn't go anywhere. He like withdrew. He ran against Buchanan. Um, so, you know, I think there's clearly this is all serving in service of the argument that there has been great disquiet and lack of consensus about what this country is about and what it should be doing after the Cold War. Yeah. And so I think from this wing that you are sort of scratching at, uh, I would say a couple of things happened. I think there is a unconscious consensus in the country uh, that the U.S. economy never really bounced back in a way that was equitable from 2008, right? So like mm -hmm. we go back to 2012, the, the Romney-Obama election. I mean, it's sort of like two competing very optimistic visions of America, right? So like the center left Obama pitch is like, okay, we just like do a little bit more of a social safety net. And like even, even himself, he's the avatar of a certain type of thing, right? He's he's the, the biracial future. He's the law professor, right? Versus mm -hmm. you know, Romney is the, the devout Christian, uh, the, the family man, the management consultant. It's like literally an MBA versus a JD, even though Romney is JD. Like, um, and it's like it's just competing about like how to how to speed up the car that we already have more. Um, hmm. Trump's pitch is completely different, and you know the Hillary Clinton thing by 2016 is it had become a machine politics thing in which the, the central appeal was her uh, the, the essential stated appeal was was her gender, right? You yeah. know, I'm with her. This, this is what they led with their argument. I'm Shattering not, the glass ceiling of the Javits Center, right? Like I mean, more cringe, no, can't suit empire. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I, I think, I mean, I'm just sort of biased. Like I remember I graduated college in 13. Um, you know, I, I think there had been sort of just a view that like, you know, of course the U.S., it was taking a long time. Unemployment was sticky, but it was, it was going to be fine by like 15, 16. 
Um, and I think, you know, a lot of the candidates who ran against Trump ran as if that was the case. I mean, I remember when I moved back here in spring of 15, it's like a lot of debates about like, the biggest things in, the, in this town before Trump were like whether or not to extend the export import bank or like give trade protection authority. Right. Like 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 R Paul Ryan, who becomes the Speaker of the House later that year, was jumping over hoops to give Obama, you know, expedited trade. These are the biggest issues, right? Versus like Trump comes up two months later and he's like, I remember distinctly in May 15, he goes, this country is a hellhole, right? And like, it's just like this incendiary, caustic, negative rhetoric, very pessimistic on the state of affairs of the country, super resonated. And it resonated on the other side too, right? Sanders is not a communist, but like, I mean, you know, he's clearly quite hostile to the market. Um, and has been saying the same socialist shtick for, for 70 years. And so um, these guys wouldn't have been as successful in 2008, I submit, right before the crisis. Um, I, don't, I don't think they would have been as successful without the, the, the war on terror and us, us effectively losing that. Um, so the Trump pitch, I think, you know, a lot of times people try to glom their own message onto it. I think Trump himself, you know, is not... Um, know, he's not a political philosopher, per se, he's not going to sit down and write all this stuff. But I think his inclinations are pretty clear, which is that the US is overcommitted overseas. Um, and meanwhile, the economy doesn't work for the average American. And so that's the essential pitch. Um, and I think the Republican Party is the weaker party. And so Trump uh, was able to take it over more easily than Sanders was able to take over the Democrats. And I think to an extent, you know, the, the Trump's message is more radical, right? He's not an anti-capitalist, versus Sanders is. And that's kind of where we are. And I, I, I don't mean to keep roping on like Sanders, like the guy lost twice, like who cares? But like a lot of these people who voted for, for Sanders, I think ended up, and were a meaningful number ended up in the Trump camp. I mean, you could have imagined another future in which this sort of like corporate capitalist, you know, status quo party was the Jeb Bush party and the Clintons had lost and Sanders had been the non-interventionist question everything guy or Sanders' successor or AOC, or whatever. Like that's a different vibe versus the Dems are clearly the party of the American establishment now for better or worse. And the Republicans are clearly the party of the American anti-establishment. You can say, oh, well, I'm gonna wash my hands of, of, of both these guys. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. But like as manifest in uh, like real politics, like those are your options. Where does Biden fit in that story? Because he is obviously the figurehead of the Democratic Party, but as an individual, he is a he seems to me a little more unpredictable than other these other Democrats, Obama and Clinton that you mentioned. You know, he he did wind down the war in Afghanistan, um, which he took a, a lot of heat for for how that was executed. Um, he uh, we'll talk about Yemen in a minute, but mm -hmm. he, um, you know, he stopped funding the Yemen war before getting reinvolved with Yemen. Um, and you know, it's it seems to me that his approach has been you know, a little more hesitancy to get U.S. troops directly involved in things, but a willingness to, you know, send lots of money places. So how, how do you evaluate um, Biden in that kind of these kind of like shift this like shifting ideology that's happening in both parties? Yeah, I mean, look, this is a longstanding position. I think Biden's pretty underrated as as a like political figure like i don't think like mm -hmm. he became president by accident i think he he has cobbled together a sort of um distinct appeal that was right for the moment and potentially i i, I mean i i i, <laughs> I know it sounds crazy I, I still think he's the democrat's strongest possible candidate this year i think there's something wrong i mean yeah. is that an indictment of the democratic party right like like what does that say about them i mean, I mean if, what are they going to replace him with i mean yeah i mean replace him with harris are they going to replace him with newsom replace him with gresham whitmer so the like, good word above might replace him with Harris, right? Like, sorry, the good word above might, in fact, uh, uh, him with yeah, Harris. that's yeah, okay. I mean, so like, I, I let's show me, did, okay, I'm just not just ducking your question, but did, like, yeah, very yeah. quickly, like, those are the three names I hear the most Whitmer, Newsom, and uh, Harris. So, like, you know, it's Harris. I, I don't think anyone was making the argument that Harris is a more potent general election candidate. So, let's just take her off the map right now and do respect to her. Uh, Whitmer is the governor of Michigan. This is completely untested. 
he passed by making her VP for a reason last year. We, we know nothing about her. Like th that just strikes me as a, it, it could work. The honeymoon could work at exactly the right time, but it's a major gamble, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I think people underrate like how difficult it is to just come out of uh, nowhere and, you know, be very, 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 very good on the stunt, right? George W. Bush was from a family that had done this forever. Uh, even Clinton had been governor of Arkansas for like six terms. Uh, uh, Trump had been a mega celebrity for half a century. Uh, you know, there's an ease, there's an ease in the public eye that's hard to teach, where it would be really coming from small ball. Uh, and then Newsom, like, I, I get it, I get the appeal, but I would say two things. One, does it suddenly become a referendum on California and his uh, management of California, right? This is, this, this is something that, you know, I think conservatives often get wrong. California is a great place. It's just being run into the ground by the current governor, in my view. Uh, and then secondly, uh, does he just look a lot smaller compared to Trump, right? Like it's a, we have a former president of the United States against uh, a sort of controversial governor. And then third, um, you know, this is, this is a completely neglected uh, piece of the, the Newsom puzzle. The one thing that, you know, I just moved back from California. The, the one thing you, you notice about California is it's just really not that African-American. I, I think it's I think it's 8% of the state. And so, like, is Newsom going to be able to turn out the black vote in Milwaukee, Phoenix, Detroit, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Atlanta, Vegas? That's really how this election is going to turn. Is he going to be better than that than Biden? So to answer your question, I think Biden had a few things going for him. Um, one, I think in a, a Democratic Party that is this aligned on pretty radical identity politics, it is absolutely necessary to have an old white man in charge of it um, because there are just <laughs> enough swing voters that are going to think, oh, look at this. It's like 1994 still. Like, it's Biden. It's whatever. It's not that scary versus like if they actually have like the governor of California or Harris, like that's a lot more visceral. Right. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, um, you know, like, I don't think he's he's an all time speaker. Like I, I always sort of contrast it. So Obama and Trump were, were all time stadium speakers. Right. Like they could fill up these enormous things and, you know, that they're, they're like incredible stage performers. And then Clinton, um, Bill Clinton, you know, you hear, uh, uh, you know, like everybody who's ever met him. It's like I, he can talk to you like you're the only person in the room. There's a, there's a very there's a sort of glad handing intimacy dealing with Clinton. He's sort of the tiny desk concert president. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. A man of that, but maybe not your stadium show, right? right. Like, okay. But, no, no, no. I, I, I co-signed that. No, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, but like, I mean, I think Biden's pretty good, right? Like I think but like, Biden in musical terms, like, are we talking, you know, he's selling out like smaller indie venues? Like what is Biden in terms of musical terms? I mean, <laughs> Uh, I mean, well, the problem is he's become the president. So he's gonna be, he's gonna be someone like very famous, right? Yeah. Like, like it's, I, it's Biden like Biden strikes me as like a sort of medium energy Billy Joel Madison Square Garden concert, where it's like you know exactly what you're getting. It's not gonna be anything groundbreaking, but you know what? A lot of people like fucking Billy Joel. Yeah, I, I don't know. He's like he's like the Eagles. It's been like around he's forever. Like yeah, That's it's right. it's fine. It's the it's been since the seventies. It's fine. Yeah. I don't. Know. It's like you know, it's it's pretty good, right? Like yeah, like, and like. Like going up, um, you know, in a crowd of people and talking with like uber confidence is actually pretty hard to do. Um, and then additionally, I think there's something I sort of refer to with Newsom. I think having an ease with black people, um, if you're an old white guy, is also pretty hard to do. Um, and like he, like that's why he won the South Carolina primary. Um, Delaware is actually a very African American state. Um, and I think uh, African American. Poor, poor African Americans are the base of the Democratic Party, much like poor whites are the base of the Republican Party. We just call them something else. We call them evangelicals. And so, like, I I, I think this is this is this is key. And like, I mean, any any Republican that it did not have a strong relationship with evangelicals um, struggled actually, right? McCain and Romney they had turnout problems, in my view. Um, versus Bush, George W. Bush, and Donald Trump actually had pretty separate um, strong relationships with him. You could make the exact same argument about the Democrats, which is like, what are the years they lost? Hillary Clinton, John Kerry. These are like not, these are not noted uh, connectors with Black America versus obviously Clinton, the first Black president, Obama, and now Biden. So, anyways, like I think, I think, I think uh, subbing him out, um, if you can put two words together, which is increasingly a question, uh, but if he's able to do it, I think, I think is is not the move, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty bearish 
um, on that happening. In terms of like what his views are, I mean, he's always had this sort of, again, I, I don't think he's this, I, I hate to ter- use the term, like he's not a grand philosophical thinker that implies that I think I'm smarter than him. I, I'm sure like there's all kinds of things that he knows that, that we don't know. This is a talented individual, right? I mean, like I think people, it's always it's, it's sort of cliche that this sort of Richard Van Kramer book, uh, what it takes, you know, it covers the 88 presidential campaign. Biden is a major fixture of this. This is like kind of when he, when he wanted to be the president when he was like 48, I suppose, like 108. Um, and like it talks about like, you know, it, it's 88 is like the most boring presidential year ever. Right. Like where at least is on the surface boring. It's like Al Gore, Bob Dole, George H.W. Bush, Dukakis. Like it's not box office, at least, you know, in, in the grand sweep of history. Um, but Ben Kramer makes this 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 point that like pretty much any major presidential candidate um, is going to be like the guy who could, you know, talk to any girl at any bar in the country. There's like, there's a real confidence to them. Like in person, uh, there's a, there's a real, uh, there's a real charisma there. Like I remember I went to, um, and my brother is completely different than me, a complete normie, non-political person who lives in Ohio. And we went to a, I had to go for work. I went to a Ted Cruz, Josh Mandel rally in May of, yeah, in May of 22. And like, he like really didn't want to go. And it's like an Ohio church at like 1130 in the morning on a Saturday. And like, he like met Ted Cruz in the bathroom and it was like, he met Mick Jagger. It was like Ted Cruz. <laughs> and like, it's like, like, and then like, you know, you see like Ted Cruz walks into the room and like, it's hammy, you know, like it's, yeah. it's whatever, but like, he's really good. Like, you know, and it, it, it doesn't translate so much like on the phone, he just looks like a joke or whatever. Like, it looks like probably to like millennial people, like, you know, like it's not who we're talking to, not who he was talking to. Um, and I have my own critiques of Cruz, whatever, but like you forget the star power these people have, um, especially, you know, not on uh, YouTube. And, and I was stunned by this because I, a few years back when it was um, Ted Cruz running against Beto O'Rourke, I was in San Antonio to cover um one of the debates between the two. And it was interesting because Beto O'Rourke had attracted that flashy Vanity Fair cover and an awful lot of mainstream press fawning. And I thought the phenomenon was kind of interesting, especially because O'Rourke, I mean, he's married into basically El Paso royalty, this like, you know, West Texas heiress and West Texas politics are just kind of interesting. Somebody who's, you know, very soft and sort of pro-immigration in a bunch of ways, uh, but coming from a place where he actually has a lot of experience. Um, you know, being on, I guess, El Paso City Council and dealing with border issues. So yeah. Beto was a, an interesting candidate to me. But the thing that was just so stunning watching this debate and Cruz and O'Rourke facing each other was just the degree, to your point, that Cruz just has this sort of like, he's not a jock, he's not a cool kid, but he has a certain amount of like, almost high school bravado, like wittiness that can just kind of, it feels like he can just kind of push a Beto work type person around Beto work just likes like the flailing art student. He just looks pathetic uh, in comparison to Cruz, whatever you think of their policies. And I think that that's a testament to the fact that Cruz just had an awful lot of experience. And as the Gen Z's would say, like he has Riz in a way that O'Rourke just frankly doesn't, uh, you know, I love a skateboarder, but like I cannot in any, you know, in, in any sort of good faith, justify the fact that Beto work is um, charismatic to the vast majority of American voters. It's just not true. I have nothing to add. So, I mean, I, I, yeah, so I think that's how we got, I think that's how we got Biden. And then like, just to completely close out the differences, like, I think uh, uh, he seems to really, he seems to really believe his oldest son, Bo, died because of these things called burn pits in Iraq, uh, which is like, it's like basically U.S. military personnel and assorted allies allegedly burning military equipment probably mm-hmm. about as dangerous as it sounds, or at least to us now. Um, and, you know, I think he does have an underrated rivalry with Obama, which is mm-hmm. like, um, uh, in, in, so everyone lo- lo- loops on Trump doing the opposite of Obama has done, but in some ways Biden has done the opposite of Obama did too, which is he got out of Afghanistan, by yeah. uh, Obama didn't get out of Afghanistan. Obama was very dovish on Iran. Biden has been more hawkish on Iran. Obama was seen as dovish on Russia. Biden's been hawkish on Russia. Hmm. So to what degree is so much of his, to what degree are his current policy preferences and the agenda that he's pursuing just him expressing this giant chip on his shoulder? 
I think he has a chip on his shoulder. Yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, I again, so like, I mean, to just we just did a bunch of arguments, which I guess is just completely out of vogue about why, about why Biden's impressive. Uh, but the reality is, I think you see a, a, a clear demonstrated history of him having, of him being insecure, like, you know, not having the school credentials that a lot of his, especially the Democratic Party, which worships school, um, he doesn't have those, those credentials. Um, and, you know, especially being an old white guy who kind of, he's kind of a BSer. Right. in like a, in a party that's like super doesn't like that kind of thing. Right. Like in a lot of, in a lot of ways, like <laughs> you're a very good Republican. So like, I mean, so like he has to, he has to, you know, he has to operate in that environment. And I think you have seen his insecurity expressed uh, a, a, a number of times. Um, yeah. It's a party we, right now that seems kind of captivated uh, by earnesty. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people who believe in this sort of self-aggrandizing sense that they have the moral high ground. So there's something very funny about watching them tie themselves into knots to try to justify Biden, who is fundamentally either extraordinary, extraordinarily forgetful or constantly playing very fast and loose with the facts. There's like a little bit of a dissonance there. But, you know, at the end of the day, what Biden's doing plays well to some degree. No, no. I mean, I, I, I think it's just like, this is why people think this is like unimaginable. I think it's like they're going to put him up and it's going to be pretty good and they're going to get pretty close. And I think he's probably favored to lose, but like, I think subbing him out, the, the chances of him getting destroyed are way higher. Hmm. Let's talk about what Biden has been doing in Yemen. Um, mm -hmm. He announced these U.S.-led airstrikes uh, against Yemen, um, not in a press conference or anything, but in very Biden fashion in just a press release where um, he said, you know, they're a direct response to un the unprecedented Houthi attacks against international maritime vessels in the Red Sea including the use of anti-ship ballistic missiles for the first time in history. Uh, January 9th, the Houthis launched their largest attack to date, directly targeting American ships. Um, and last week, together with 13 allies and partners, we issued an unequivocal warning that they would bear the consequences if their attacks did not cease. And these targeted strikes are a clear message that the U.S. and our partners will not tolerate attacks on our personnel or allow hostile actors to imperil the freedom of navigation in one of the world's most critical commercial routes. So, I mean, the, the rationale he's laying out there is that, you know, they were warned, they kept striking commercial ships. There's a, you know, the, that's one of the legitimate purposes is to, of our Navy is to protect, uh, you know, commercial shipping lanes. Um, before we get into the, you know, how that process, the, the process of that, could you just weigh in, Kurt, on the rationale? Do you think his rationale for the strikes is sound? Um, I think he's in a position where he doesn't want to get into a war of Iran. I think there's a position where he doesn't want to completely abandon the Israelis. I think he's in a position where he doesn't want to, you know, he can't throw in with his party's left wing, which um, is, ex you know, exceedingly pro-Palestinian and believes Israel is an apartheid state. Hmm. Uh, so I think the Houthis are like, I, I know this doesn't directly relate to what that message has said, but the, the Houthis are a pretty low hanging fruit. Yemen is one of the poorest countries in the world, if not the poorest. Um, the Houthis are, um allies of iran but they're not really iran there's differences between them more than i think the press likes to emphasize um and what do you so, mean by that oh um i mean so uh well yemen had a civil war in the early 2010s yeah. um so exceedingly complex and really sad um the houthi rebels um, have effectively won which meant that the coalition mm -hmm. run by Saudi Arabia and the Emirates uh, lost uh, or close to it. So Yemen borders South Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, yeah. Bin Laden's father was a was from Yemen, mm -hmm. um, so it's like close ties here. Um, I mean, there are religious ties. I think that the, a lot of the, the Houthis are Zaydis, which are sort of a sect of Shia Islam, and obviously Iran is a Shia Islamic 
yeah, you know, theocracy. Um, but like, I don't think the Iranians, I'm a believer, I'm a subscriber to the view that the Iranians don't incrementally call the shots um, with uh, the Houthis uh, quite in the same way that they do with Lebanese Hezbollah, which I think is a fairly direct uh, proxy of Iran. Um, and so like, this is this, this is a long way of saying that I think the Houthis do stuff all the time that isn't like cleared with Tehran in a James Bond fashion. So there's a little bit of sort of different foreign policy heft, you would say, to Hezbollah's actions compared to Houthi actions. But that's something that a lot of the mainstream press is getting wrong right now. Sure. I mean, I, I mean, I, I think that they're getting the alliance with the Iranians wrong. I'm not sure mm -hmm. how much it matters, but they, they're, they're getting it wrong. And then additionally, like if the U.S. were to bomb Lebanon, that would be a major deal versus if the U.S. bombs the Red Sea. Like, I think that is misguided and we shouldn't do that. And that's not in the U.S. national interest, but it's not like the sky is going to fall. Yeah. Which, I mean, again, uh, which, is, which, is, which is why we are in this default, right? Which is like, like, uh, you know, I don't think there should be U.S. troops in Niger or Burkina Faso, right? And mm -hmm. these troops were killed early. This is the most terrifying, terrifying part of the world, the Sahel. Like, mm -hmm. These you know the troops that were killed very early in Trump's term in office, like the number of senators who said we have troops in Niger, like, mm -hmm. like, but like it doesn't matter, like, it, like nobody cares, or not enough people. Right. But uh, you know, um, th there's the the fact what when you when you put tr scatter troops all over the world, then you know you're laying these trip wires to allow for some sort of something to go wrong and then inviting more in intervention on top of intervention. In this case, we're talking about commercial ships being attacked. Um, I guess that's kind of the root of my question for you is, you know, you're someone who is writing from an non-interventionist standpoint, um, but would you agree with the general notion that you know, that's a legitimate security function of the United States is to secure, to play a role in securing shipping lanes. No, I don't, especially it's shipping not. lanes that we don't really use. So like, I mean, this, this is mostly a German problem and a Chinese problem mm. as far as I'm aware. So like- What well, do you mean shipping lanes that we don't really use? Isn't it something like- The Red like Sea is not that important to use. of the world's total commercial shipping traffic? Or are you just it's saying that's, most of it- That's not, not American though. Like the, the, yeah. world, the world's, cause, okay. But supply chains are so interconnected. Like, can't you just make the case that it still ultimately affects us, or you not? Can. So much? I don't believe in the case. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, I, mean, I, I mean, like, I mean, like, so I, I, I just, I don't think that it is. Okay, I'll just get into this. I don't think it is in the U.S. national interest to secure all the waterways of the world. I think, hmm. we'll be, I think we will be fine if we don't do that. And particularly, I don't think we should, we should be expending a lot of resources securing the waterways that we don't currently use. Now you can say like, maybe this is gonna make like X thing from China more expensive. I think we roll with it. I think, I think it's a lot better than, than, than getting a lot of people killed. I, 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 think, I, think, it's, I, think, it's, I think the risk of escalation is, is, exceeds the risk of supply chain problems. Yeah. You know, I, I'm also curious what you think of this statement that Biden made to a reporter in pa it was kind of in passing on January 18th, again, in a very Biden kind of mumbly way uh, when he was uh, asked whether the strikes were going to deter the Houthis from attacking more ships. This is what he said. Let's roll that clip. Are the airstrikes in Yemen working? Well... When you say working, are they stopping the Houthis? No. Are they going to continue? Yes. Okay, so there was a lot of uh, background noise on that, but basically he said, "Are they going to? Are the strikes going to stop the Houthis? No. Are they going to continue? Yes." Um, so I mean, he's plainly stating there that these strikes aren't actually a deterrent. So, what do you think is going on here? He's being honest. And yeah. he's he's too old to forget to be on, to to lie. <laughs> but what, what, what is the what is the purpose then if they're not if they aren't actually deterring, and and that's like the authority that you know he has is to act as a, a deterrent. Um, what's the purpose of this what, what what are the purpose of the people that are pushing these strikes? Yeah, 
I, I think they think they will. I think they think they will be more effective than Biden does. Mm. So I think uh, this is just my read. Um, I don't mm. not in the man's head. Uh, I don't think Biden is a super believer in this. I think he is triangulated politically, um, and I think he's rolling with it. And I think that's uh, what he's done. Like, it, it, again, to bring up Sanders, like it's a lot easier to. Uh, be an 80 year old in office if you just say the same thing for the last 60 years. Biden has to do this same juggle act <laughs> because he's more Machiavellian or sociopathic, if you prefer, prefer. And so, like, he literally just sometimes says, says the truth, which is he is skeptical of the Pentagon assessment on this, um, but he's doing it anyways because it seems like the least bad option. The, 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 the devotees of the strike uh, think it will do um, uh, a lot, do, will do more. And then additionally, quite critically, uh, they generally don't really uh, uh, seem uh, like they want to stop with Yemen, right? Like, like there's, yeah. there's very, very few people that are like, this is, this is the biggest issue in the world. We need to do regime change in Yemen. You don't hear that, right? You hear what? Iran. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so everybody, and everybody is, is pulling their punches on this. The, what do you mean? Been, play, that, pull, yeah, we'll play that out a little bit more. What do you mean everybody's pulling? I, I think it makes it look like Biden. OK, I don't mean to make it everything sound like it's just this cruel, uh, um, selfish calculus is going in. Like there mm -hmm. are very well-meaning people. Uh, that, I mean, I'm a libertarian. You could convince me that politicians sure. are involved in selfish calculuses that aren't actually for the betterment of anyone. Right. Like that's not. I think Biden is in a pincer motion in the Democratic Party. Uh, if he abandons his establishment wing on Israel, he is going to fundraise poorly and risks losing like a lot of rich people to either third parties not voting or even to Trump if he plays his card right. Mm -hmm. He uh, completely stiff arms the left wing of his base, which is increasingly just openly anti-Israel. Um, he risks turnout problems. So mm -hmm. uh, attacking uh, a low-grade ally of the Palestinians mm -hmm. uh, in a way that probably won't result in intense escalation with Iran probably seems like the least bad option if you were just looking at the five feet in front of you on the road. Yeah. What about if you were looking at more than the five feet in front of you out on the road? Yeah, if you want, if you want, um, if you want regime change in Iran, then you want as much U.S. attacks on Iranian alleged proxies as possible, including starting with Yemen. So if you hit Yemen, then maybe Hezbollah. Okay, so like, for instance, Hezbollah has been pretty careful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hate to say this of like an Islamic militant group, but they have like not done that much. Right. Yeah. They have not given Netanyahu pretext to start a war with Lebanon. Um, it's again, like the northern border has just been sort of simmering ever since roughly October 7th. I mean, it was obviously simmering a little bit before then, frankly, but mm -hmm. they haven't really done anything provocative enough to warrant much other than basically what is it, 100,000 or 200,000 Israelis being sort of, you know, deciding to move out of that area. But right. beyond right. that, there hasn't been like a single explosive day where it's like, oh, this is really reaching a boiling point. No, I mean, and the, the world can change on a day, right? Like it did on October 7th. Yeah, but yeah go ahead. And, well, I was going to say that that's perhaps why there's been um, some backlash to what Biden uh, is doing here. Um, you know, uh, without getting authorization from Congress, um, I think think he sent them like one letter afterwards, uh, mm -hmm. but no signs of bothering with congressional approval for any of this. Mm -hmm. And there's been, you know, that's not surprising at this point. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when do presidents we, ever bother with congressional approval for yeah, war? It's, it's, exactly. so, it's so past day. It's yeah. So past come day. on. But, uh, there, there's been, you know, some tweets from both people in his party and, uh, you know, the Mike Lees of the world saying, uh, you know, you, you need to you know, run this by us. There was a letter sent by four senators from different parties. But yeah, that there is, to Liz's point there, it's like, will this make, and I, I like, I appreciate the pushback, uh, especially when people are going against their own party, but 
how likely is any of this to actually amount to any action to restrain Biden or, you know, Congress reasserting some sort of primacy in this question? Uh, not from the left wing. I mean, uh, the, 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 I mean, the, yeah, I mean, uh, one could really only imagine it in, in a Republican context. But again, the Republicans themselves are divided. Like, like you know, the, like there's not there's not Repo enough Republican senators. Like it's hard to see the the votes on it. But like yeah, I mean the the asserting congressional authority stuff has been mostly from the Republicans so far. Although I mean like you know like the only I mean if you believe this um, you know Vance argument we put up on the site yesterday, um, like we actually did have an assertion of, of a congressional authority um, in embryonic form, which is this supplemental. Um, which looks DOA in the House, but you know is is probably poised to go out of the Senate. Um, is would make it uh, you know impossible for Trump to to leave NATO, or any future president to leave NATO. So that is actually uh, uh, an escalation of congressional authority. Um, it's just to keep the, the global okay. system going further. Keep you. In, it's yeah, it's yeah, the you opposite of the all, spirit yeah. of what you were just. Right, right. Um, I mean, how much credence do you give to that? J.D. Vance argument. I saw him circulating that and Rand Paul also uh, circulating it saying uh, my understand my interpretation of it was there saying that it's it, it's committing. Let's say Trump wins in 2024 because the funding for Ukraine is scheduled to go through 2025. Then if Trump were to broker some kind of end to the Ukraine Russia war and and the funding that that would somehow be illegal or impeachment worthy. It didn't quite add up to me, but I like is is there anything of substance there in your opinion? Um, yeah, there is. I mean, like I think it, it, like if Trump were to try to negotiate or to try to change the U.S. relationship with NATO, then it would be lawsuits and probably a Supreme Court case. Number one, if this passed, which I don't think it will. If it does. Um, and then uh, secondly, uh, it doesn't really matter if we think any of this is silly. Uh, if the Democrats have the House, they're probably going to impeach Trump again if he's the president. And hmm. um, it's not. I mean, it's, it's it's not unimaginable that Trump could win the presidency. And the Democrats could take the House. The, the Republican margin is like three House seats and like people forget where these house seats came from. Like they, like they won like in like New York state, the Santos seat, um, Southern California. Right. Like I, I actually think that's like it's, an interesting it's story. Sort of the, well, the, the thing that many people have, have talked about is like that it's the, um, states that are a little bit more, um, embattled. Uh, but then a lot of things that are sort of just regarded states that are regarded as these, you know, just solid Democrat strongholds. They're sort of the ones that the modern Democratic Party has really neglected. And so like, you know, I live in New York, there's not very much focus on New York and bolstering sort of like Democratic support here. And so to some degree, it's like, well, you know, you're really seeing this sort of slow, steady trickling off of some of these congressional seats. Is that correct? No, I think for sure. I mean, it's, it's sort of a different topic. Uh, what I'll say about it is that I think that's a very, very real dynamic. I'm not sure with the, the Trump focus of this year, that it's going to be a big deal. Although who knows, mm. you know, 2022 was, it was a surprising election. Um, I mean, my basic view is um, my, my cut is everybody thinks that 2022 election was, was, was the Trump election um, and he lost. And so he's a loser. Um, my view is actually that it was, it was the DeSantis election. And, and by the way, the, the Republicans won the popular vote um, in 2022. Um, it was just, it was, that, that was the anti-woke election. Um, it's just that the popular vote was poorly distributed. So where did the Republican message that the U.S. culture is off the rails um, resonate more? Actually, uh, it had some sympathy in Southern California and New York State. Um, and then in these purple states where things are perhaps more moderate, uh, Arizona, Virginia, they try to win three congressional seats, Georgia. It's like, what are you talking about? Woke, 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 woke. Well, woke, 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 woke is not so much a joke on Long Island, um, but it, it sounded insane in Northern Virginia. You know, um, on that issue, on, on the NATO issue, this, I'm curious where you, what you think 
let, let's say things do head in that direction and that there's a sort of rebalancing of responsibilities within NATO. Maybe I don't know that the U.S. is going to be leaving NATO, but maybe, you know, not kicking in so much anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's indisputable that like, look, here's a, a graph of the defense expenditure share of GDP among the NATO countries. Way over there on the left, you've got the U.S. and and recently Greece contributing above the recommended uh, two percent of their share of GDP, and everyone else, you know, most of the other countries are well below uh, what NATO says they should be kicking in for their own self defense. In Greece, um, it's all monopoly money anyway, so it's not like it's it actually yeah. Money, unfortunately, right? the Greek the Greek, really give a shit. The Greek contribution is going to be. Not gonna, yeah, that's not gonna. I mean, it's an interesting story. I'd actually like to read about that, but it's not gonna make or break it. And then and the other ones, you not to make you, I don't know if you can go back, but the other ones yeah. are, the, are the UK and the Baltics. So, th mm -hmm. this, this is what I was talking about in terms of like what, what kind of coalition, we come yeah, yeah. So, like Lithuania, Poland, Estonia, Latvia, these are the uber anti Russia you know. hawks, um, and the UK. Um, so like that's basically it, basically it. And then once you get into the under, like, okay, Croatia, uh, yeah, Balkans were always ambiguous a little bit on Russia, depending if you're, assuming you're not Bosnia, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, France, you know, like, you know, always could go either way. Um, you get the point. Yep, exactly. And then this is, you know, showing the, this is just another way to visualize it. The share of the Alliance defense expenditure on the right there, the U S 70%. So, I mean, there's, um, yep. you know, if, if this were to change, what do you think that would mean for the world? Like how, how would, what would be some of the major shifts that you would expect to see, um, because I, I assume it's something you you would like to see. If the U.S. Uh, amends its relationship, or if the U.S. Um, you have, the uh, U.S. says we're course. we're not gonna we're not gonna be covering seventy percent of the bill anymore. Then I think that it won't be as radical as people think. Um, I think that the NATO will be less financed. Um, uh, that other countries will actually step up. I actually do think Trump's sort of, you know, New York mafioso ways on this like are actually pretty effective. Like um, at least they're more effective than the status quo ante, um, and then I think the, the the major contribution of of NATO is Article Five. So who like will if, who will be stepping up? I presume it's not Latvia, right? Who are the who are the people who can step up? Yeah, I mean we have UK, we have Germany, but like like realistically, how will that gap be made up for? Well, I don't know if the I don't know if the gap will, will be made up for in terms of all the money. Like yeah. So like uh, my view is that why is NATO important? NATO is important because of Article 5. The mm -hmm. U.S. is treaty-bound to defend any NATO member from an invasion. Mm -hmm. Everything else is conversation. Like, in my view, is NATO could be halved, mm -hmm. and there wouldn't be a, a, a functional distinction. Now, uh, people who don't have that view would say that means Ukraine is doomed, mm -hmm. uh, but Ukraine is not a NATO. And so for the, for, for the NATO parties, it is the U.S. guarantor. That's it. Um, in terms of like who could who could make up some of the gap in in my uh, truncated NATO in terms of the financing, um, I mean, clearly the Germans, clearly the French, clearly the Italians. Hmm. Are you are are you concerned about um, like play it out for me uh, a Biden re-election and what this means for NATO and what this means for Ukraine funding and or you know the war effort there versus a Trump election? Like play it out for me in the shortest possible version. God, isn't it, isn't it crazy? The Biden re-election somehow feels like less fathomable than the Trump re-election. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. I mean, it, it feels weirder, right? Like it just, it's like, what, what, what are we going to do? <laughs> like, um, but I, I think uh, if Biden is re-elected, I think it's possible that, as mentioned, the Democrats will take the House. I think the Republicans are going to take the Senate, um, mm -hmm. uh, potentially by a lot, actually. Um, uh, uh, who knows? They have a, quite a track record of not delivering on that. But um, and I think it, they'll take it as this, you know, grand moral vindication. And I think that the, the, they'll get another eight package through. And um, mm -hmm. but who knows? That also assumes that, that that my armistice doesn't happen and doesn't keep. Yeah. So. But then what about the Trump like alternate reality? What about oh, that? I mean, I mean, I complete game changer. I mean, I think, uh, I don't think it's like 
Trump is going to sit down and just give Ukraine away. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I think you have seen consistently that the Trump was more hawkish than, than people in the panic mode uh, thought he would be. Um, but I think, I mean, you could look, my basic view is like this stuff is intractable without either a de facto or de jure recognition that Russia is going to have control of parts of Ukraine. Like, like we, like Russia has been in charge of Crimea for a decade. And so much of the discussion of this, we are tongue tied on because we have to pretend like the Ukrainians are going to retake it. Um, and so a president that doesn't really care about those niceties um, actually could go a long way to, to, to brokering peace. I want to ask you briefly before we wrap about Tucker Carlson's sort of interesting tour throughout, um, you know, Moscow and now the Middle East. He basically sat down uh, with, you know, Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow, um, I suppose, last week. Uh, it was kind of an interesting interview in some ways, though. I was somewhat disappointed. There was a lot of him... Um, you know, talking up what an impressive journalist he is without necessarily discovering, um, you know, much new terrain with Putin. I mean, Putin, it's sort of clear some of his justifications for those who care to look as to, you know, why he believes it is permissible for him to be um, making a claim uh, of Ukraine. Um, I didn't feel like Carlson really got to a new place in that interview. But then the thing that has been interesting to me is Carlson's sort of fawning comments about Moscow and Putin's leadership um, and the quality of these these vast cities that he has now uh, spent some time in. Uh, he was making comments in a speech uh, in Dubai with an Egyptian journalist and, you know, lots of people. It's, it's sort of an interesting moment because it's almost like Carlson is using um, his interaction with Putin and his experience in Moscow to make the case of American cities are total shitholes. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, really via, you know, these authoritarians have an awful lot to be proud of. I'm surprised by the reception this is getting on a lot of the right. I see these trade-offs as totally impermissible, right? Like, I don't want Lee Kuan Yew in charge. I don't want Vladimir Putin in charge. Um, what do you make of this ascendant view on the right? Is this just a reaction to liking that Tucker Carlson um, sat down with Putin at all? What does this mean? I, I'm not sure Carlson's advocating for authoritarianism, so I'm not sure he's making the the, the Lee Con you argument. I think what he's arguing is is that uh, is that uh, um, Russia invests in its own country, and if the U.S. invested in its own country um, and didn't have I, I think it goes back to the clip. That you, so he's you, saying like, we need more public works projects. Like what exactly? I think, I think maybe this is part of the problem with Carlson is that it feels like a Rorschach where it's kind of like you can see what you want to see, but there's a, he's wholly imprecise in his comments and the specific thing that he wants changed about American cities. Well, I mean, he's a journalist, not a politician at least yet. So, I mean, <laughs> I think these are, these are observations and gripes um, yeah. more than, uh, uh, a platform. Um, but I think based on what he said and based on my understanding of his, of his views, like um, you don't need public works projects to not have crime. Like I, mean, I think mm -hmm. we had cleaner subways in New York in the nineties. And uh, the, if, if, if the U S political capital was focused on that and not on Yemeni pirates, um, we <laughs> might, we might get somewhere. Mm -hmm. This is the argue. This is the fundamental argument that Rand Paul was making in that clip we played at the beginning, where you know uh, that, that you're hearing more and more from uh, the the Rand Pauls and the JD Vances that why are we sp sending all this money to Ukraine when we have all these problems on the border, mm -hmm. where people are living paycheck to paycheck? Um, do you think that is a an effective message um and like are these things necessarily like how how linked are they in actuality like border security and whatever you know how much how many millions of dollars we give to ukraine yeah i think it's very effective and i think i mean and i think it's way more linked than people like to think i mean mm -hmm. i mean the the uh the u.s could militarize the border I, I mean, I mean, look, I, I'm not. It is a 2,000 mile long border. It is not a joke to secure it, um, but I don't think it is beyond U.S. capability. Um, and it, you certainly can't make the case that the U.S. has tried as hard as it can 
while maintaining this global empire of dubious utility to the average American. I think mm. part of my frustration or concern is that I see the connection between quality of life issues in American cities and, you know, federal government authorizing foreign expenditures like, you know, aid abroad as I mean, these are just kind of entirely different levels of government, right? Like to some degree, you're attempting to say, you know, the U.S. needs to, Congress needs to rein in, um, you know, its authorization of, uh, you know, aid packages directed toward Ukraine or Israel or what have you. And you're also saying Eric Adams needs to do something specific in terms of like, you know, improving NYPD patrol of subways, right? We're just talking about entirely different uh, levels of government and different voters, Um different politicians like it, it feels a little bit like these aren't apples to apples comparisons to me well yeah okay I, I think that's fair but i think carlson is somebody who comes from uh the you know the media business and i think what he would see um is that it matters what americans are talking about and so yeah we don't want to be embarrassed of our country we don't want to be embarrassed and then be well, traveling abroad and feel a sense of like wow do they have a set an almost like pride of ownership type thing the u.s has been spending 30 years talking about the conditions that we have to improve abroad. Uh, meanwhile, the amount of airspace that is given to the shape of Ohio uh, or the Bronx um, is pretty limited in the national, air, national space. And I think that's really what he's kind of talking about. I'm not, I'm not sure he's recommending a works project, progress administration yes, for, for, uh, for, for Brooklyn. Um, but like, well, you know, I'm, uh, I, I hope that's not the case. I, I do sometimes worry the way that I hear some of the national conservatives talking about this stuff that mm -hmm. there's a, you know, even your, your comments about, you know, militarizing the border. It's always like, okay, um, we can't use our personnel and our toy, our, all our military toys overseas. So we're going to somehow like turn all that stuff internal, um, and we have to like spend all this money on infrastructure here. I, I don't know. Like, I guess that's the, you know, where, where the libertarians bristle against the, sure. the national conservatives, uh, even if we ultimately agree that um, our our global military presence is way overextended and inappropriately used. Yeah, but I mean, I, I do think that functionally, though, this is uh, due respect to all, a lot of people that we all know. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's a little pie in the sky. Like, like what? Like, what is the next Republican administration going to do? Like, what is like the what is like the most guaranteed piece of legislation that Trump's going to get through? What is it? I don't know. What is the it? PCAJ extension. They're going to extend the Trump tax cuts. Yeah, it's like there's like the one thing they're for sure going to do, right? And then if they like, if, and if then if they executive action the border, uh, like. I mean, you, you'd have to make a libertarian case for open borders, effectively. And I know you probably have people in your milieu that will make the, the case, but I don't think that's going to be like, you know, a Watchmen episode or whatever. <laughs> uh, I think we should uh, have you back on sometime in the future to argue about open borders and, and border processing capacity. Uh, Kurt Mills, it has been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for speaking with Reason. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.